I'm Anne, and today we're actually going to start our very first conversation, which is what is a vegan? So Ella, <laughs> mm, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your background and why it is you went vegan? I would love to. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually just seven years old mm. when my vegan journey started. Mm. Uh, I came home from school one day and we had learned about Daniel Boone in school. And for those of you who don't know who Daniel Boone is, he is one of our first American folk heroes. And uh, I told my mom, I said, Mom, this guy was so mean. He shot animals and he ate them. And why are we celebrating him? Mm. And she was just very honest with me. And she said, well, Ella, uh, you know, we're very lucky. We get to just go to the grocery store now mm. and buy our meat. We don't have to do that ourselves anymore. And it was at that moment that I connected the food on my plate with the animal that it was. Mm. And I... I lost it. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I am never doing that again. Mm. And that was it. I mm. never ate animals again. Uh, and then I started to learn more about all the industries, mm -hmm. the animal agricultural industries. By the time I was 15, uh, I was completely vegan and uh, actually got into animal rights activism at mm -hmm. that time and also uh, started my fitness journey and career. So it all kind of came together at that point. Wow. Yeah. And so what's funny about this, right, is at that point, uh, Ella and I had become friends and I was just starting to think about um, wanting to eat less meat, right? So I guess you could kind of say more vegetarian. And so I started cutting it out and everything and there was no more meat on my plate, but I just had like veggies and maybe some starches and things like this. But I was like getting sick, right? And I was like, okay, there's something I'm not doing right here, you know? There's a whole world of vegetarians out there. What are they doing? And so of course I uh, asked Ella, hey, could you help me sit down and look at this? And I really learned how to create balanced meals, what kind of uh, minerals and vitamins you need to have and how you do that in that world. And since then I've been thriving. So let's see, that was almost 17 years ago that I stopped eating meat. Um, for the first six or so, I was doing um, a little bit of milk and cheese and then I um, had some fish in there from time to time, so pescatarian-ish. Um, and then uh, Ella was like, you know what? You're already there, Anne, you know? And of course I learned a lot about um, factory farming and just what we, as a society have done to uh, agriculture and farming in general. So it sealed the deal for me. Once I got in, so you could kind of say I came in via health benefits, right? Uh, once I did that, then it was like, oh, I'm here to stay for the animals, right? So it was a little bit opposite, but Ella was the catalyst, right? For me, um, really kind of putting the stake in the ground and deciding that for myself. So, you know, during this little us sharing with you all, obviously we've been talking about a lot of terms, right? We've said vegetarian, we've said vegan, we've kind of said activist, pescatarian. What are these things, right? Well, that's what we want to do is have a great discussion around unpacking all of these terms and sharing that with you. So we've invited a uh, Charlottesville local, Dr. Elsa Spencer, and um, we're gonna have a nice chat with her. She actually has a doctorate in uh, nutrition and health sciences, and she's been vegan for God knows how long. <laughs> so uh, we'll want her to share a bit of her background and, um, and have a real great discussion on what are all these terms and how we can make it a bit more accessible for you. Sounds good, let's do it. Awesome. All right, great, come join that discussion. Well, welcome, Dr. Elsa Spencer. We're so happy to have you. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. So um, would you mind explaining a little bit about your background? I know you have a doctorate in um, nutrition and health sciences, but what does that actually mean? <laughs> right? right. We'd love to hear that. Um, well, let's see. I got my PhD at Emory University, mm -hmm. and I was in the graduate division of biological and biomedical sciences. So nutrition and health sciences was one sort of subject area under that division. So there were other, there were biochemistry, cell biology, molecular biology. So it was really a really sort of a biologically focused mm -hmm. um, degree. And then from within nutrition, we got to pick five, one or five tracks. So um, some of them were more research and cell oriented focused. Um, international health was a really big focus at Emory, still is actually. 
Um, so nutrition, you can imagine like feeding programs under nutrition, food insecurity. So that was a really big area um, in addition to some of the molecular and more sort of biological cell based options and then the option that I went with was epidemiology mm. so I really often I say I have a PhD in nutritional epidemiology because I was in the epidemiology track in the nutrition program okay and what and does so, epidemiology right. mean <laughs> well I was gonna say haven't we all become armchair epidemiologists mm. since we've been in an epidemic mm. uh, so huh. I do think people are more familiar with the word now um, mm -hmm. a pandemic is just a worldwide epidemic mm -hmm. and so epidemic <clears throat> comes well epidemiology comes from the word epidemic and so it has to do with the risk factors and the distribution of disease that's what epidemiology is mm -hmm. so the nutritional epidemiology is the risk factors and the distribution of diet related disease so how mm -hmm. does diet impact disease both its spread and how to develop it in the first place wonderful wow mm -hmm. really great so interesting yeah, yeah. and um, my understanding is that you chose to live a vegan lifestyle as well as plant-based diet mm -hmm. uh, when did that happen and what had you make <laughs> that decision <laughs> mm, that's a good question well I was already vegetarian so mm -hmm. I went vegetarian at 14, which was a long time ago, <laughs> and uh, just like five years ago. At least. Uh, and then I was vegetarian for a handful of years. I was the only one, I was sort of the first one in my friend group. No one in my family was vegetarian. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of information about, um, I, I stumbled across some factory farming leaflet and, mm. and went vegetarian of my own volition. Um, and then, but I didn't, I don't think I understood until I went to college. So I went vegan my first, at the end of my first semester of college. So mm -hmm. I was 18. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, as soon as I figured out, oh, hey, these animals that I'm eschewing eating, like I'm putting, I'm not eating them because I don't think they need to be killed in order for me to survive. I didn't realize so many of the, you know, like my egg products, my dairy products. I didn't realize that those animals that were being raised for those products were mm -hmm. then going to be slaughtered. It actually at a pretty young age compared to what they could live to. Right. And so I was like, oh gosh, if I want to be an ethical vegetarian, if I want to be a vegetarian to avoid, I know I was a vegetarian for a number of reasons, but just on this one particular slant, mm -hmm. if I wanted to be a vegetarian in order to avoid or reduce animal suffering and sort of eliminate the need to have them killed in order to feed me, which is obviously not necessary. Here we are alive and mm -hmm. you know, we're doing okay. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, if I was gonna do that, then I really needed to be vegan in order to complete that particular mission, mm -hmm. that particular objective I had. Mm -hmm. um, and then as, as in college, I wanted to, I started off double majoring chemistry and environmental science. And as I learned a little bit more like, oh, actually, you know, dairy farming has all this agricultural runoff that cattle farming has. And so it was really kind of the same. I realized, oh, these are sort of the same industries. They have the, uh -huh. you know, the same effects on our water, on our air, right, right on the earth. Uh, fossil fuel, I mean, methane mm -hmm. contribution from cows that are raised for dairy is equivalent to the methane contribution. I mean, cows are cows. They make methane. Right. It's a big greenhouse gas. Um, this was 20... Uh, I had to do the math here. 28 <laughs> years ago? Amazing. I was 28 years ago. And so, um, gosh, 29 years ago, it's 2021. <laughs> so it was um, 19, end of 1992. So um, a little more than 28 years ago. And now, of course, climate change is a much uh -huh. more omnipresent topic, but it was sure. just as relevant. Yeah. You know, it was just as much of an issue. So when I realized the animal products were really very, had similar impacts mm. and similar effects to animals themselves being consumed, mm. I was like, okay, I just need to go ahead and make that final switch. So I was 18 when wow. I went vegan. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and how many years for you, Ella? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> vegan, uh, I think we're going on 25, 26. Wow. Yeah, nice. so not, not quite, but, <laughs> but very close. Very close. Very close. Really That's neat. like when there were no cheese alternatives. I was going to say, like, yeah. I, was, I was in Asheville, North Carolina. I went to school in Asheville and um, great school, UNC Asheville ah. and um, small school. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, and Asheville is still a pretty vegan friendly place and it was a pretty mm -hmm. vegan friendly place at the time However, the world was not a very vegan friendly the right. United States at least was not a very vegan friendly place And I was getting my tofu in five gallon buckets in water <laughs> if I didn't bring a bag or a container There was no tofu for me. <gasps> oh goodness. Um, I mean it was just you know I had to bring containers and yes. it was just a different the vegan cheese was not good the vegan right. ice cream was not good <laughs> There was no vegan cream cheese. There was no vegan sausage, at least not that I could find. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, now I raise children vegan and we eat, 
they can eat any analog that their mm -hmm. right. omnivorous friends yes. or colleagues might. You know, so it's just it's a totally different world. Absolutely. And the cheese is good, and the ice cream is good now. <laughs> yes, and exactly. there are options. <laughs> there are. I can there choose are. any kind of plant milk as my sort of basis <laughs> yeah. of choice, right, for these right. analogs. It's really neat. I remember, actually. Yeah. yeah trying the first vegan cheese Ooh, that came uh. out. And you know what, I always I, I always say that I was, I feel very lucky mm -hmm. in a lot of sense right. that we didn't have those mm. vegan, you know, fake meats. Right, and, uh, right. Because you had to eat whole foods, right. uh, which is mm -hmm. a very positive thing. <laughs> uh, right. However, you know, for mainstream, it is fantastic. For transitioning, it's yes. great, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But right. yes, I do remember that first vegan cheese. <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> like, what was that? I don't right. even know what it was. It's it was so that. funny. That's like the story now for like when, you know, your grandpa says, uh -huh. I used to walk to school with no right. shoes. Yes. It's like the vegan story. Yeah. I had to buy my toe in a bucket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? It's true. Yes. It's true. So, okay. So we've thrown many terms around right now. Right. Okay. So what is ultimately a vegan, right? So first off, vegetarian. I think most people know that that's really where you just don't really eat any meat, right? However, that has variations to it. You could be lacto-vegetarian, ovo-vegetarian, or you can be lacto-ovo-vegetarian, <laughs> um, meaning that you eat eggs and still just plant-based diet, or eat, that you have dairy and plant-based diet, right? Lacto being milk and then ovo for the eggs. So some vegetarians keep it at that. Um, plant-based came about, right, because as we've been talking a lot about vegans, um, vegans believe that actually, as Dr. Spencer has been saying, she was making that connection that, wait a second, it's not just the food on my plate, it's actually now the um, cosmetics I might buy, the mm. shampoo I might buy, mm -hmm. or, um, uh, for instance, I was even looking into, because here at Hogs and Kisses, we're going to be opening up a bed and breakfast, mm -hmm. I was even looking into bedding mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't use wool. So anything that commodifies mm -hmm. an animal as well, or that the dyes use animal pieces to it or what have you. So anything that would, and vegans will use the word exploitation. So anything that utilizes an animal for our benefit, not theirs, is what distinguishes then a vegan from a vegetarian. Um, and so that then has these implications, right? Where what we're looking at is, is sure dietary reasons. And I think maybe that's right, Ella, why most people would say, oh, I eat plant-based, but I'm not vegan, mm -hmm. is maybe they tend to do it more for the health benefits. Yeah, and I don't would know. You say that? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people do use them interchangeably. Uh -huh. Right. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this yes. to uh, really get clear on that. Yes. Because I will, and I see commercials <laughs> for products claiming to be vegan, and I know they were tested on animals. And mm -hmm. I'm like, they're not vegan, but mm -hmm. they're not certified, so they're going to throw it around there, like, because that's the trend, you know, that's right. what people are going to buy now. Exactly. But it's important to have this conversation to make that distinction. Yeah, that it, it's now, it's, um, how can I say, it become more of like this marketing term, right? Where we was, I had come across some type of infographic where they were talking about a travel vegan, a vegan till 6 p.m., a you know, weekend vegan, so whatever. Um, so we're, we're laughing about that because when you decide to adopt the lifestyle or the diet and lifestyle of a vegan, you're really looking at the far reach of where animal products are used in everything. So it's not like it has a time limit. It's not that we are in a different country and somehow that boundary changes. Right? Mm. It is a full lifestyle and commitment that you have. Um, so that is the distinguishing, right, between plant-based, vegetarian, vegan, right? Oh, and also too, I know a lot of times um, when I shared my personal story, pescatarian. I was doing that for a little while. Like I literally was eating vegan per se. Like I had cut the milk and the cheese out, mm -hmm. but I thought, oh, am I getting enough protein? Mm -hmm. So I would throw in a bit of fish or something like that. So no, that does not mean I was a vegan who ate fish. I was pescatarian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 
we got to make that distinction and call a spade a spade, right? Is is what that is. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. when people say vegan till six, what they're really <laughs> meaning is maybe they're eating plant based until yes. six. Right. Mm -hmm. And usually that would be, I would think, for more for the health benefits, mm -hmm. which one of the reasons we're really happy to have you here, Elsa, yes. to talk about the health benefits. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And absolutely. the difference between you know the vegetarian benefits versus vegan. Exactly. Because I think what we're finding is that there's so many statistics, right? There are so many people out there that say, no, I've read this it's study, yes, that says that meat is still good for me, right? And then when you get down to it, they'll say, no, wait, heme iron from meat is bad for you. But then others will go, no, it's a particular type or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's how come there is so much disparity in nutritional data? That's a big question. It's a so, big question. Yeah, I don't know where you need to start with it. How long do you want me to go for? <laughs> right. Uh, so I'll just I'll just go, and you can sure, interrupt me please. or ask me questions. So, I'd say I say there's probably two reasons that there's so much. I would say maybe confusing mm -hmm. um, information out there about nutrition, and mm -hmm. one. So one reason I think is that there is intentional confusion sowed, and I, I haven't just made that up. I'm not the first person to have said that. There okay. was a, an interesting study done maybe five years ago mm -hmm. um, looking at all of the nutrition literature published and funding sources and mm. scientists who might have um, accepted lobbying money from the dairy industry, the um, Cattlemen's Association, right? So, um, so looking at that sort of looking at that sort of piece and. Um, some literature from the Dairy Council on a big meeting they had in um, 2008, I believe, was talking about intentionally sowing confusion because mm -hmm. it was sort of, so this actually, this was originated, um, they weren't the, the original guys to sort of come up with that. That was mostly tobacco industry back in the uh -huh. day. So uh -huh. they would say, you know, I think there's an old sort of infamous tobacco memo that's like, confusion is our product, right? Confusion uh -huh. is because we don't have to so much convince people that smoking is good for them in mm -hmm. order to have them buy. They just, we just have to confuse them enough about uh -huh. how many, in which setting, mm -hmm. what time of day, what kind of cigarette filter, no filter, all of these things. Right. Um, mm -hmm. If there's enough confusion, people can just sort of say, well, gosh, I'm just gonna do what I want. And yes. so the dairy industry back in 2008 at some, one of their meetings um, is, I've, I've read it and I don't remember the name of the meeting, but I've read in print where they said, you know, confusion is our brand, you know, because if we can sow confusion, then mm -hmm. then it, it, people can sort of get fed up with like, well, is broccoli good for me? Is saturated fat, in fact, bad for me? Uh -huh. I thought it was, but then Time Magazine had that big cover article in 2015, which the dairy industry had a lot to do with, <laughs> and, you know, and, and said saturated fat isn't bad for you and butter is fine. and. And so people sort of get confused and just say, forget it, I'll just eat whatever I want or I'll eat right. whatever my family's eating or I'll eat whatever my friends are eating. Or yes. So I'd say one of one of the reasons then for the confusion is, is intentional confusion um, sort of placed or um, presented mm -hmm. from the industries themselves in publications. And I would say the, the other one would be maybe just not intentional confusion, but... Um, but uh, funding, just mm. uh, there's a there, the the choice of statistical analysis. So the different types of studies that can be done. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, I mean, we could really like, without getting into all of the different epidemiological types of studies. But I yeah. think we know, especially from looking at COVID. Uh, maybe we've heard about different kinds of studies. So now we're doing vaccine trials. Uh -huh. So trials, I think people are more familiar with, and these are also the most powerful looking at diet. So uh -huh. lock people in a ward, a metabolic ward or whatever, feed them a particular diet, study uh -huh. their blood, that sort of thing. If you can do a trial, an intervention of any sort and really control your um, exposure to some particular thing of interest, then you can be sure that whatever outcome you see, if you control for other factors, right, that that's related to the exposure. Exposure. So, mm -hmm. for example, right, if you give people a prescribed diet and it has a certain number of saturated fat grams per day, a certain amount of cholesterol per day, it has these particular animal sources, it issues this and that. Oh, of course, you could also do this with a vegan diet, right? Uh -huh. A low-fat vegan diet or a whole food vegan mm -hmm. diet or a smoothie-based diet. So sure. we can, you can give them some particular thing and control exercise and control mm -hmm. smoking and control mm -hmm. all these alcohol intake and all these other confound other variables that could muddy the association you're looking for. Uh -huh. And then you can know, hey, this thing that we found, this is really caused by. Mm -hmm. So those are really the only sort of causal relationship type of studies you can look at. Mm -hmm. 
And there are other, there's lots of others, but just to go sort of to the other end of the spectrum, you can just take a cross-sectional, like a snapshot in time, uh -huh. and basically just say, okay, mm -hmm. what's your cholesterol level, and how often do you eat these things? What's your cholesterol level? Mm -hmm. How often do you eat these things? What's your cholesterol level? How often do you eat these things? Well, the thing is that it's been known since, <clears throat> Gosh, 1979, I believe, was mm -hmm. the year. So something many decades before, let's say, the, the, the big story broke, 2015, on the cover of Time magazine that said, actually, it was the end of 2014, I think, um, it said, butter is back, mm -hmm. you know? So uh -huh. the dairy industry, right. like I said, in 2008, was seeing sales start to decline as the health, aware, uh, health awareness about saturated fat and cholesterol was really coming up mm -hmm. in the 90s and early 2000s, mm -hmm. um, and, which was great, right? All that scientific research was really starting to come out, and mm -hmm. um, the dairy industry and other scientists were well aware that if you look at a cross-sectional sort of snapshot in time, um, and looking at people's diets and what they and their health outcomes, let's say, yeah, you know, their cholesterol levels. Um, have they had any history of heart disease? Or do they have? Are they on blood pressure medication? Whatever it is, there isn't really. There's just not the statistical power to see the, any kind of association. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's you know not that interesting to get really kind of technical to talk about. But basically, it's just everyone's baseline cholesterol level, for example, is just different. And that's just uh -huh. genetics and whatnot. However, I see. everyone who eats lots of saturated mm. fat from animal products, their cholesterol is going to go up. And by a particular amount. It's just mm -hmm. that our baseline where we start changes. Mm -hmm. Likewise, mm -hmm. let's say I start at you know, 110 for my LDL level, my bad cholesterol mm -hmm. level, and you start at 100, you start at 140. Uh -huh. If each of us then go vegan right. from our regular sort of omnivorous diet, we're all going to experience, say, a 20 milligram per deciliter drop over a month. It usually uh -huh. takes about two weeks, actually only about two weeks to uh -huh. see a drop from eating incredible. vegan, which mm -hmm. is really amazing. It like is a, 20, a, a, a noticeable, yes. meaningful, statistically meaningful drop in yes. cholesterol. So anyway, um, because we all start in different places, even though we uh -huh. all have that same response up mm -hmm. or down, Got it. when you take a snapshot mm -hmm. and you look at diet associated with um, just some outcome like cholesterol, blood cholesterol, there isn't a, a mar that you don't really see an association because there's just so many other factors that affect cholesterol, exercise, alcohol, body right. weight, right? Our cholesterol mm -hmm. just goes up as we gain weight, mm -hmm. right? Even if we're vegan, mm -hmm. uh -huh. a little bit. Even uh -huh. as we get older, cholesterol goes up. So age yes. is a factor. So if we don't control for anything and we're just taking a picture, mm -hmm. and like I said, we've known this since the late 70s, mm -hmm. that that type of study just looking at Right. Questionnaires, basically, sure. in one part, uh, one time, one sort of moment in time, that doesn't say anything. Well, that's so. That's what the. Mm -hmm. That's what the. Um, it was a scientist who's friendly with the Dairy Council and has taken money from the Cattlemen's Association, and so they found him uh -huh. to do these big review uh -huh. and saying, right. "Oh, guess what? Saturated fat right. is not related because it was all these cross-sectional studies, sure. and without any knowledge, which most of us don't." carry around sure. about different types of studies, they mm -hmm. say, oh, that's so great. I can eat my butter in, with impunity. I can eat my uh -huh. cheese with impunity. Uh -huh. When actually, of course, their cholesterol is going to be going up. Their risk of heart disease and stroke yeah. and, sure. you know, all sorts of all sorts of other issues right. Um, right. is going up all the while, mm -hmm. right? It's really, it's yes. really kind of... Okay, good. So, so let me see if I, so I got that, right. right, that basically, so every human is so different. Now we're trying to create a um, study that says, wow, there's actual causation. The right. best you could do is look at correlations, right, mm -hmm. where, oh, something might come down mm -hmm. or not. So being that it is so loose, mm -hmm. companies will utilize this Sometimes. and utilize that, that we can't actually create a blanket thing for every human being and then utilize that to their advantage by causing some confusion enough that people won't c continue to research more and maybe uh, look into something and they'll go, oh, well, I'll just eat this out, right? Right. So the confusion Got could it. be intentional or it could be just sort of a product of poor study design, right, which could sure. or could not yeah. be intentional. Yes, right. And so it's mm -hmm. a, you know, it can be kind of either way. And I don't mean to say that every scientist who comes up with some finding right. you sure. know, is yeah. doing something intentionally. Sure. It could be poor study design or maybe insufficient sample size right. you uh -huh. know, that doesn't sure. find as an association clearly enough with, say, eating your sure. broccoli. You yeah, know, exactly. That's right, good for right. reducing cancer risk, but it, but it is <laughs> on a population level. If you do, you know, if you look at it in enough people, uh -huh. so right. so there's right. I would say intentional or perhaps just poor study design. Uh huh. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and it was and it was interesting with that that big 
that big study just to come full circle. Sure. So it's not just my opinion. Uh -huh. You know, the, the, I think he was the head of the School of Public Health at Harvard after uh -huh. that time study came out um, said, this should be retracted. This is uh -huh. this is not consistent with the mm. body of knowledge that we've had for decades on the association of saturated fat with mm. all sorts of heart disease and really, you mm -hmm. know, morbid outcomes in people. Sure. Like mm -hmm. this is irresponsible. Yes. So, right. Yeah. yeah. I think one other little, you know, kind of <laughs> funny point here uh, yeah, right. to Thanks. make because there is so much confusion. <laughs> yes. Right. And so people see this study and that study, like mm -hmm. we're talking about. So then they'll go to, oh, I knew this vegan once. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You get that, especially right. Right. You know, over the 25 years I've been vegan. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. They'll say, I knew that she was very sickly uh -huh. and scrawny right. and you can't get enough protein. So right. you'll use like one example. And I'm like, well, how many non-vegans do you know right. that are getting sick and uh -huh. dying? And, but just, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. I do. Well, and that comes down to then like, who funds the data yeah, or then was, who looks at the right. data and then interprets mm -hmm. it to their own belief or their own um you know outcome that they want right their own desired outcome because right. that always helps to skew things right right and that's it's the, the tricky thing right mm -hmm. because if we just continued on that one example so mm -hmm. I don't, there are other examples of course but the sure. one from Time Magazine, like it, he's a scientist that, you know, ran this meta-analysis and it was published in a peer-reviewed, Time just covered the peer-reviewed publications, uh -huh. but then you have to look at who is funding the mm, scientist. Right. And that's not right. necessarily obvious right. to, mm -hmm. once you get to the secondary source, which most of us are consuming, like in news or in Time uh -huh. or in a diet column, unless mm -hmm. we're going back, hardly anyone is reading the medical literature. Right. And that's the only place you're gonna find a funding find disclosure. And then sure. even then, Sometimes the name, it doesn't say the mm -hmm. National Dairy Council, it may be uh -huh. they're contributing to, there are corporate, there are yes. agencies with scientific sounding names sure, that are sure. funded corporate. Right. You know, and that's a feature that we find outside of nutrition as well, of course. Right. You know, this was a really so, um, big it's tricky. topic. It's really hard for us to really it see. It is. You know? Yeah. It really and this is. was a really big topic in the um, documentary Game Changers, mm, which I loved, which mm -hmm. by the way, we absolutely love documentaries as well, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Get such good information there. Um, but I remember <laughs> them saying that and that there was a particular company that would utilize their name and no one really knew mm -hmm. them. But they mm -hmm. so anyway it was a You're lot right. of um, yep. a lot of swaying and bias mm -hmm. going on but being presented as factual and such like that so yeah so we we understand <laughs> that it's confusing out there for mm -hmm. sure and what would be the best way uh, just proactively <laughs> to yeah. for our, our, our viewers mm -hmm. to to figure that out to mm -hmm. find reliable that's a, sources? That's a good question. I would say I, there's a few sources that I really trust other than myself, obviously, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm really lucky that way. But um, nutritionfacts.org, Michael Greger, we really great. We love Dr. Love Greger. Yeah, Dr. Really Greger. great, um, really great source. And um, and I say I know these people personally, right? Mm -hmm. So I, we used to go to vegetarian conferences 20 years ago before <laughs> they had Nutrition Facts. Uh -huh. and um, so, so that's a great resource for they review the peer the the peer reviewed medical yeah, literature right, and break exactly. it down. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty it's pretty technical though and pretty pretty mm -hmm. scientific. Mm -hmm. um, I really PCRM Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine oh. PCRM.org. Yeah. They have fabulous resources. Uh -huh. They've done a lot of clinical trials they, okay. themselves actually. Uh -huh. So it's a it's a group of PhDs and MDs who hmm. are willing to sign on to, to support a plant-based diet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and as you said that could mean eating vegan but maybe not living a vegan lifestyle right. but it could also I didn't want to interrupt at that time it could mm -hmm. also mean just towards vegan consumption mm -hmm. so maybe mm -hmm. vegan several days of the week or vegetarian mm -hmm. sure. but 80 percent of the way towards vegan and I know mm -hmm. that can be really confusing but mm -hmm. I do see that term plant-based used right. in mm -hmm. something that's yes. right um, vegetarian mm -hmm. and maybe mostly consuming of mostly consisting right. of plants. Yes, right? right. So, but not entirely. Right. Not entirely vegan. So, exactly. the, these doctors who are members of PCRM may not all be the the, the supporters, the mm -hmm. big organization who are who have membership in that may not all be vegan, but they're but they're advocating. They recognize the benefits to health uh -huh. of the plant based diets, plant based right. diets, yes. and or vegan diets. Mm -hmm. And um, PCRM themselves are 
um, those guys are all vegan and they run a lot of really great clinical trials. Nice. And then I think that hmm. they publish information that's slightly less technical than Nutrition Facts, so a little more accessible. Mm -hmm. They also have vegetarian starter kits and a lot more yes. sort of public oriented. Sure. So they're a great organization. The Vegetarian Resource Group, VRG.org, oh, okay. uh -huh. also has a couple of um, registered dietitians. Um, I also volunteer for them. I've been volunteering for them for 20 years nice. at local festivals. Mm -hmm. And um, they're great small nonprofit that um, really just has so much information. <clears throat> so in terms of, do you, you know, if do you, you want to know if French fries from Wendy's are vegan or something like that, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. Um, you know, just <sighs> info. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's there's a lot in that question, question, right? There is. There is. <laughs> there's a lot, a lot in that question. I'm just going to leave that alone. Uh, but the, um, and I don't know the answer currently because we don't usually right? buy that. But, yes. but, you know, there are other reasons to eschew French fries. And there are reasons maybe right. to, to get them if you're a teenager and out with your friends. And, sure, right. right. So uh -huh. lots of lots of ways. And I have a teenager who's vegan. Very so uh, at interesting. home. interesting. So yes. lots of interesting stuff. But they have that kind of information, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have $5 cookbooks for an 18. I started with one when I was turned 18 and went oh. vegan. I was in college cooking on my own and didn't know. I couldn't handle mm -hmm. these big, complicated sure. recipes. Uh -huh. So sure. they've got just great resources uh -huh. again the, the information for people whose children want to become vegetarian and the parents don't know if they're going to get enough iron or uh -huh. get right. enough protein yes and they have that information mm -hmm. so those are some great sources um, and they do look at pcrm and nutrition facts look more at the literature i'd say yes. vrg is a little bit more resource so mm -hmm. to answer your question about the literature i'd go those two um mm -hmm. vegan outreach has a registered dietitian who i trust and know personally and mm -hmm. um and I, they, veganoutreach.org has a, a health section mm -hmm. and they look at the literature a lot of times okay. and will break down exactly how many micrograms of B12 do you need for a particular ah. age? What have we found? So that, I, again, nice. very accessible, uh -huh. but, but really competent um, scientific sort of background mm -hmm. coming into those recommendations. Those are sources that I look to. Um, mm -hmm. John McDougall does right. a lot yes. of analysis sure. of the of the research, but he has a particular type of vegan diet that he advocates, so mm -hmm. then that can be a little, maybe that might not be for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. mm -hmm. well, I think this all brings up such a good point mm -hmm. on today's topic as well, that mm -hmm. you can be a vegan who is not healthy, right? right? An unhealthy sure. vegan, you're still vegan, but right. you could be a whole food plant-based vegan, so then <laughs> right. now we're splitting up kind That's of. Because yeah. vegan inherently is about the ethics. Exactly. Really. That's so that's right. why you can be an unhealthy vegan. Yeah. Um, but that's why it's important because everybody wants to be healthy, right? right? So yes. we want to take care of ourselves just like we want to take care of animals. To me, being vegan is about mm -hmm. uh, compassion for all living beings. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially for women, uh, we, we can lose touch of that as well, mm -hmm. about taking care of ourselves, mm -hmm. because we need to take care of ourselves in order to help take care of uh, others. <laughs> others. That's <laughs> why they say on the Very airplane, true. put your oxygen mask on <laughs> first. Before, That's before, right. I tell you, exactly. before I was a mom, I, well, I questioned that every time. Yeah. I was like, shouldn't ah, I put it? Right. Shouldn't mm -hmm. I put it on my kid? I didn't have children, but I thought, shouldn't I put it on the person next to me first? Shut and up. after being a mom and not listening, not heeding that own <laughs> advice, and not running for a couple of years because I was too busy taking care of the children right. I realized I can't be mm. an effective advocate for yes. others and effective I can't be in service of others including mm -hmm. animals the children the, the environment whatever if I'm not you know caring for myself yeah, and showing absolutely. myself that same compassion it's just really a lesson I've had to learn so many times <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Me too. absolutely yeah and it is a, it is an interesting that is kind of um, because amongst for those of you watching amongst vegans we will have discussions about that about the fries at Burger King about Oreos per se right Oreos always gets people all the time <laughs> yeah. well wait a minute, minute but it's vegan right okay but how about the sugar that they put in there how did they refine that sugar many sugar plants use bone marrow to refine and that's how the sugar gets their white color right so some people go well wait a minute no okay that's a buy kind of product of it okay no it doesn't get so at the end of the day, it's really a discussion about um, wanting to make sure that we are responsible about our interactions with animals, with our planet as well, mm -hmm. right? Other than just the food on your plate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is like really good because why is it that then people choose to go vegan over vegetarian, right? And these are some of the reasons we've been talking about, um, but there are so many more, right? So many, yeah. I Originally, I think I told, I 
went vegan when I wanted to just not eat animals or mm-hmm. support the eating of animals from the animal products that I was buying whose moms were then killed later. So that was, of course, one reason, and we've talked about that. Mm-hmm. And then I got, shortly after I went vegan, um, I got into some social justice work, mm-hmm. um, and I learned, gosh, the, the slaughterhouse workers, which we got to mm-hmm. see a little bit in this COVID pandemic, uh-huh. that they're clearly working in really cl- close quarters because COVID was spreading so quickly. The mm-hmm. conditions are not very mm-hmm. sanitary. They don't have a lot of worker protections. Sure. There's not a lot of health care and all these other sorts of issues um, going on in these slaughterhouse workers. And I started to look at, gosh, just like thinking about my dietary choices and how those might impact workers' rights, uh-huh. um, worker safety, right? Worker safety, just access to um, access to good care for everybody. And, mm. and, you know, so I'm thinking about the care of the animals, but then I'm thinking about, well, gosh, who mm-hmm. are the people who are making these animal products available? They're largely marginalized. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and that's just at the that's at, that's at the end, right? Mm-hmm. That's at the, sort of the processing end of getting the food just before it comes to the supermarket. But let's come way back, like mm-hmm. the grazing land, right? Who's getting there? Yes. Who's supporting our meat habit in this country and in well in 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 Western civilization? So Europe and U.S. and Canada, you know, we we are accustomed to eating animal products all day, every day, mm-hmm. at least once a day. Um, right, vegan till six, like not, not all day, right? <laughs> only, can only go till dinner, right? And so, I mean, has first I've heard of it, but I have I've experienced the phenomenon without the term right. many times. And and so, you know, who's supporting this? Well, we don't have enough land in this country to support that, Absolutely. right? And the, the earth yes. itself doesn't have enough land, mm-hmm. water or oil to support that type of lifestyle for everybody. So mm-hmm. who am I to say, well, gosh, these mm-hmm. people, these people here in the rainforest, say, who have plenty of land, like we should be slashing and burning their right. their land mm-hmm. so that Burger King and McDonald's, mm-hmm. who are major, major, cons- they are major consumers of, of land yes. for deforested, you know, for which is being deforested, yes. desertified, adding to all of these issues that we're all mm-hmm. struggling with mm-hmm. and that we're passing on to our children. Yes. Um, it, and, you know, who am I to say that? you know, these people should lose their land to support cows for me, right? Yes. right? Or, or dairy for me, or mm-hmm. eggs for me, right? And mm-hmm. eggs don't take up quite as much space because they stack these poor chickens it, on top right. of each other with, in cages. With no feed. But still, like, yeah. their feces have to be managed Absolutely. in waterways. There mm-hmm. are, there's a lot of hidden land use, water use, mm-hmm. fossil fuel use that people are suffering with. I grew up mm-hmm. in North Carolina, which is like second only to Iowa in terms of pigs. Mm-hmm. Where in North know, Carolina? Chapel Hill. Oh, shut up. <laughs> are you from Chapel Hill? Yes. <laughs> I was born and raised in Chapel Hill. That's so funny. Well, we should years. talk about that. Yes. Sorry. So, <laughs> another college town. So, um, and, you know, and so North Carolina, as you may know, then has a lot of waterways polluted from all of the pig it's farming that's been going right. on and tobacco yes. farming, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so when I look at, you know, how can I be a responsible steward of the earth? How can I, of course, you know, look out for my fellow beings, mm-hmm. including my fellow human mm-hmm. beings. Yes. I can set a good example with my food, but what about mm-hmm. my fellow human beings who are Absolutely. needing to feed themselves and their family? What's the most efficient way to do that? What's the least land intensive, least fossil fuel intensive, least mm-hmm. water intensive way? Mm-hmm. Well, that would be to eat plants, right? Yes. So having like, where do, where do animals, like everyone's on and on about protein. Well, where do the, where do the animals get their protein? Absolutely. They get it from plants, plants right? And That's it's right. so much more efficient, right? To just get it directly we get all that same all those same amino acids you know every plant protein just in case it needs to be said every protein every (laughs) source of protein on earth has all 20 amino acids including all the ones from plants they all do it's just how proteins are made they have to have all the 20 amino acids there or else you just don't get a functional protein and so you know looking out for the people from the beginning whose land yes and resources are being used to where they can't afford to, to eat that meat, to buy that meat, all the way to the slaughterhouse workers. There's so many social justice definitely reasons well, and human And then if you also look reasons. at where, say, your fast food restaurants right. Right, are all in low socioeconomic areas, so marginalized communities, like you're talking about, are being told that a 69-cent burger is just normal. Well, 
you have to think about that. Just like you're saying, you know, that meat and was a tumor on it, was cut off, but now that's being sold that, you know, and that the is allowable what- allowable amount of pus that's in our dairy, right? Yes. There's an allowable level. There's and an allowable amount of salmonella on chicken. Right. And, and it's that a that risk. that is being presented as a food option. Right. And, you know, it really, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, a fantastic reason to want to choose a vegan lifestyle because of those kinds of impacts. Yeah, we're all animals. Right. right. Yeah. So human right. and non-human animals. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, so funny enough, um, uh, being that one of our board members, James, is in the UK, um, I had recently learned that in the United Kingdom, they have now passed laws for people who have ide ideologies that may not necessarily be a religion per se, mm -hmm. but ideologies like veganism. Now they have these laws that protect them as mm -hmm. well. So there's been a lot more um, policy or activism coming out because these laws have been passed. Mm -hmm. um, being that obviously, right, religion is is a, a bit more in terms of um, rituals and so forth for a higher power per se, but veganism would certainly fall into a uh, ideology for the betterment, right, of all living beings per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Elsa. Thank you. Um, and, you know, we really just appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for beating around the barn with us. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for tuning in.